Thou shalt not kill. The little self says, me? I'm not going to kill anybody. Don't worry about me. <laughs> you must be talking to somebody else. No, 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 I mean you. Thou shalt not kill. And so we walk past. We don't hear that commandment. We have no intention of killing anyone. No one has to tell us that. Oh, but wait a minute. Do you know what I'm talking about, little self? When I say to you, thou shalt not kill, what do you think I'm talking about? What do you think I mean by killing? Well, you mean killing a person. No, I don't mean killing a person. This commandment is not about homicide at all. It's not about something you do with a weapon. Greetings from Pit Lake in Pit Meadows, British Columbia, and welcome to Stare Up Your Purpose channel. Thanks for stopping by. If you are new to this channel, welcome. And if you are drawn to the absolute or infinite way teaching, you are welcome to subscribe. But only subscribe if you know you are truly drawn to these teachings. The ideas shared on this channel are directed to those who are ready for the meat of truth and not just the milk. Those who are not ready will falter when the words seem to challenge their age-old mindset and ideology. In the infinite way principle, there is no God and. There is just no room for human race in this principle. So, stick or poke around on the channel. And once you know the ideas, concepts or principles resonate with your inner truth, then do not hesitate to subscribe. We are not looking for quantity, but quality for iron sharpens iron. I love Pit Lake in Pit Meadows. It is the second largest lake in the lower mainland of British Columbia, about 53.5 square kilometer in area. It is about 25 kilometers long and 4.5 kilometers wide at its widest. It is one of the world's relatively few tidal lakes and among the largest. I met someone at the Carina Leblanc Park the last time I was in this area. He saw me with my camera and said, I need to check this place. And I'm glad I did today. Today I will be sharing the footage from Pit Lake with the 8th class from the Mount Hood seminar series given by Harp Fitch in 1976. There are 10 classes altogether in this series. And I've shared the first 7 classes. You can check the link below or up here for classes one to seven. This eighth class that I'm sharing today is titled Spiritual Fidelity. In this series, Herb takes the listeners on a soul journey. It brings out the inner truth of the symbolic meanings of the Ten Commandments. And in this eighth class, it touches on the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Key takeaway for me in this eighth class is contained in this statement. This commandment is not about homicide. It's about suicide. And it has nothing to do with killing with a weapon. Nothing to do with material killing. It has to do with killing your own spiritual identity. Killing, it is the same as denying the inner reality of the Christ. When you reject the Christ, you kill the Christ. Of course, the Christ doesn't die. You who reject the Christ die. And so we are learning that killing biblically means that only the dead can kill. 
the living do not kill. Only the dead can kill. And because life is eternal, wherever you see killing, you are seeing that which is not happening in life. Life is eternal. Nobody can kill it. As usual, I leave you with my favorite half-fit statement from this seminar. And I hope you like the beautiful images from Pit Lake, British Columbia, Canada. As the saying goes, I get to kill two birds with one stone. I get to share my passion for the infinite way teachings and my love of landscape photography with you. Where do you begin and where does God end? Is there a place where God ends and you begin? And if you can find that place where God ends and you begin, you will not be in absolute truth. Think about it a moment. Is there a God and you? Or is there a God without a beginning and without an ending? And now, try to find yourself in that picture. Now, if you want to be absolute and you find no place where God ends and you begin, then you must go deeper than the surface of that understanding. You must then act from that awareness. See if you can accept that there is no place where God ends and you begin. And when you feel you can accept it, make the correction in consciousness, family, knowing you can never go back to a place where there is a separation between God and yourself. And now, go even deeper because there is no place where God ends and I begin. I and the Father are one. But God is spirit. And if you have pledged yourself to absolute truth, you must now accept that because God does not end and you begin, but God is continuous and God is spirit. The only reality to which you can answer is, I am spirit. Let us say that you are an infinite self made of the substance called spirit with an infinite mind infinite awareness of yourself but somewhere down in a little place called earth there is a form that is walking around and it says my name is Phyllis my name is Edith my name is Eugene. My name is Richard. And you want to talk to that little self down there because it doesn't seem to follow you very clearly. It has a will of its own. And you want to startle that little self. Wake it up. Jolt it. You look down and you say, Thou shalt not kill. The little self says, Me? I'm not going to kill anybody. Don't worry about me. You must be talking to somebody else. No, no, no. I mean you. Thou shalt not kill. And so we walk past. We don't hear that commandment. We have no intention of killing anyone. No one has to tell us that. Oh, but wait a minute. Do you know what I'm talking about, little self? When I say to you, thou shalt not kill... What do you think I'm talking about? What do you think I mean by killing? Well, you mean killing a person. No, I don't mean killing a person. This commandment is not about homicide at all. It's not about something you do with a weapon. It's something you do without even trying to do it. Something you do every day. This is the killing I'm talking about. Thou shalt not kill Christ. Well, I'm not even killing Christ. Oh, yes, you did it yesterday. 
You did it the day before. You killed your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, and your child, and you're going to do it again today and tomorrow unless you stop and listen. Well, I listen. I gave you five commandments, says the voice. You said, oh, I understand them. I'm going to study them. That's fine. And meanwhile, you're going to kill. I don't understand what you mean, kill. Well, I'll spell it out for you, says the voice. I have commanded the universe, thou shalt not kill. Doesn't it seem strange that all around you you see killing? Well, it does seem kind of strange. I've thought about it, but I don't have an answer. Well, think about it again. You see killing everywhere, and I have commanded thou shalt not kill. Do you think I have given man the power to kill my creation? Ah, a light dawns. God has not given me the power to kill his creation. Then if I pick up a gun and shoot somebody, what am I killing? not his creation. Hmm. And if I kill truth, if I destroy anything, what am I destroying? Not God's creation. And there's only one creation. When you see killing, in the physical world, you're not seeing the killing in God's creation. And behind that is concealed a great secret. What has the power to defy the command of God? Man has thought he had the power, but he hasn't. He has absolutely no power to kill divine creation. Thou shalt not. And God has the power to maintain and enforce that commandment. Then what are we doing out here? When we send boys to war to kill and be killed, are they defying God? No. No, not a bit. What creation are they living in that they can kill? They're living in non-creation. They're living in a creation that is not the creation of God. The only thing they're killing is themselves. They are destroying their self. They are turning away from their self. They are in a state of self destruction. This commandment is not about homicide, it's about suicide. And it has nothing to do with killing with a weapon. Nothing to do with material killing. It has to do with killing your own spiritual identity. Killing it is the same as denying the inner reality of the Christ. When you reject the Christ, you kill the Christ. Of course, the Christ doesn't die. You who reject the Christ die. And so we are learning that killing, biblically, means that only the dead can kill. The living do not kill. Only the dead can kill. And because life is eternal, wherever you see killing you are seeing that which is not happening in life. Life is eternal. Nobody can kill it. The revelation of divine life as being beyond destruction is involved in this commandment. But you must come further and further into what is being revealed to you in this beautiful sixth commandment. You've been given five commandments, and now the Father says, these are the five commandments you must follow if you wish to walk in my kingdom. But you're going to think you're following them while you are doing things that are not following them. You're going to be ignorant of your own disobedience. 
you're going to kill Christ while you think you're following the five commandments you kill Christ when you are ignorant of the presence of Christ you kill Christ when you do not see Christ in yourself that's suicide and you kill Christ when you do not see Christ in your neighbor this is all about spiritual killing not physical killing at all and so when your infinite self says to the little creature self thou shalt not kill it is saying recognize me I in the midst of you I everywhere as yourself recognize I in the midst of your child of your mother your father your sister your brother or you're killing Christ there you're turning away from Christ and finally it dawns on you that unless you do something about it you will kill Christ you will deny the presence of Christ now we are caught humanly in an ex inextricable bond until we know certain truth on the one hand we are killing Christ until we know the presence of Christ and on the other hand when we are not consciously doing it we are still doing it and we don't know how to come out of that sleep until we recognize what is really happening the sixth commandment recognizes this dilemma of the human mind it doesn't want to kill Christ but it does it doesn't want to deny drink to Christ but it does it doesn't want to commit suicide but it does because it has not recognized the infallibility of the divine self it has not recognized the allness of the divine self it has not recognized that the human mind is a house divided still believing in spirit and matter no matter what you do no matter what you say no matter how deeply you think you still move in the belief of spirit and matter and in the material creation the killing occurs in the material creation the diseases and dilemmas occur in the material creation the disasters occur but when you know the meaning of thou shalt not kill suddenly it dawns on you there is a force working independent of you to place before you killing disease disaster things that are forbidden and impossible in creation and that your function is to erase them from your consciousness a little child an infant has legs but it cannot walk it has a mouth but it cannot talk a word here a word there a step here but it must learn to talk learn to walk when you are aware of the power that causes the killing the disease the dilemmas the disasters the discords you will see that they are the teachers of your soul just as you stand there with a rattle and shake it in front of the child to see if it can recognize color and hear sound and be attracted to the particular sound of it so the world mind the world mind suddenly becomes revealed to you as placing before you the little rattle and it's called the killer it's called the disease the disaster and it's going to teach you how to walk in your soul it's going to teach you how to talk in your soul it isn't a negative thing at all it 
just the world mind seen from another point of view placing before you that which cannot happen in the kingdom of God. And you are to look at it and say, but this cannot happen in the kingdom of God and therefore it isn't happening. I will not be one who steals because there is no stealing in the kingdom of God. What shall I steal? My own spirit? What shall I covet? There is no matter to covet in the kingdom of God. How can I commit adultery in the spiritual kingdom? And therefore, to kill, to steal, to covet, to commit adultery is obviously that which happens in a material creation. And the consciousness which still believes in spirit and matter lives in the material creation. And these are the signs of living in the wrong creation. It's not that they're immoral that concerns us. What concerns us is to live in the spirit. We'll be moral enough there. Thou shalt not steal. What is there to steal? Matter. That's all you can steal. And there isn't any. Oh, you think it's there, but that's killing the Christ too. Stealing is killing. Adultery is killing. Coveting is killing. You're killing the allness of God in your consciousness. If I believe in spirit, I must be faithful to spirit. If I believe in matter, I am faithful to matter. If I believe in both, I'm a house divided. We are unfaithful to the Spirit of God when we still maintain the belief in the existence of matter in which killing appears in which stealing appears, in which error and imperfection appear. These cannot appear in the creation of God, and if we see them and believe them or commit them, we are in a state of adultery. Now what about our children? If we are in a material sense, we are automatically in a state of adultery. That is all material sense is, a state of cosmic adultery. And if we are in that state of material sense, the children who are our consciousness up to the age of 12 and 14 are going to be in a material sense, and we are therefore, without realizing it, teaching them to kill, to kill the spirit of their own being to commit adultery. A child of ten, a child of five, which is unaware of the allness of spirit, is committing adultery. It has nothing to do with the male and the female. Nothing whatsoever. We're talking about spiritual adultery, spiritual stealing, spiritual coveting. That which we all do in a divided consciousness. And the one who breaks the commandment of God is not you. You never commit adultery. You never kill. You never steal and you never covet. And that's the secret behind these four commandments. You don't have the power to do it. You are the Spirit of God. But the world mind does appear to do that which is forbidden in the kingdom of God. Independent of you, the world mind kills. Every killing on this earth occurs through the world mind. It seems to be an outlet through a person, but it cannot be an outlet through the Spirit of God and in your knowledge of the allness of God the killing which occurs in the physical world 
is recognized by the enlightened, by those who have received the word, as the world mind appearing as. The world mind which kills is the world mind which creates that which it kills. And even though it's hard to swallow at first, these physical forms which are vulnerable to all of the imperfections and atrocities of this world are only vulnerable because they are the creation of the world mind. It creates them, it destroys them. It borns them and it buries them. And that is the reason for these four commandments, to alert you to a great extent to the knowledge that as long as you live in the world mind, you will not obey the first five commandments. You can't just blithely go home and say, I understand. It won't let you. It's a stop. Find your life Find the life of your child. Find the life of your husband and your wife. Find the life of your parents. Don't go right on making yesterday's mistakes. The life of your child is eternal. The life of your parents is eternal. The life of your husband and wife is eternal. Your life is eternal. To turn away from that knowledge is to kill that life. Your separation from the truth of your being is killing. And you cannot simply say, I know that, and forget it. You must know it consciously, minute by minute and hour by hour, until it's as normal as breathing. The only life there is is eternal can never be killed. And I cannot kill it by lack of recognition. And so my child becomes something very, very different, not just something to love. My child is a beautiful divine message. And when you look at your child again and again and again with the knowledge that this is eternal life appearing, you will learn something that you cannot even learn by thinking about yourself. The child is your teacher in a million ways. And you're willing because you love that child. You're willing to look and to listen and to probe deeper. You're not in such a hurry when you're thinking of your child as you are about the rest of the world. And that's where you can study eternal life. That's where you can find things that your soul will recognize that your mind would never know. Thou shalt not kill the Spirit of God within yourself by turning away from it. Give it to drink. Recognize it. Nurture it. Love it. Let it bless you. Feel its presence, its power, its life, its life-giving substance, its glory, its honor. And then you are obeying thou shalt not kill. You can kill with ignorance just as you can with a sword. The world mind never turns off. It's always spinning like a clock. It doesn't even need a, anyone to wind it up. It's perpetual motion. And it is your trainer. It is going to come through as your mind until you are forced to flee from it and to flee into your own soul. 
Nothing is turning off that world mind until you move to the higher ground of soul. It is inoperable in your soul. It controls not only your thoughts, but it controls your form in your mind. We think of our mind as perhaps controlled by the world mind or influenced by it, but it's quite different than that. Our bodies are controlled by the world mind. Our bodies are completely controlled by the world mind. It controls your heartbeat. It controls every breath you take in and exhale controls the way you walk and talk and think and speak, controls your pulse beat. And as long as you live in this form, you are a child of the world mind and you are killing Christ. I have to go back to the Sermon on the Mount for this. Agree with thine adversary. I want you to see that this is the world mind. Agree with thine adversary quickly. And the world has not recognized that the adversary is the world mind. We have, but we forget it. The ocean roars up to the shore and erases the letters written in the sand. And we forget it. The world mind erases in our mind that which we want to remember. It has that beautiful trick of letting us think we know something only to discover we didn't really. Agree with our adversary. The world mind brought you into form. You don't come to grips with that, do you? You know you do only when it's brought up and then you promptly forget it in less than a week. It's normal because the world mind forgets it. The world mind is doing the forgetting and the remembering. It's not enough to remember, to memorize. Now you've got to take into your meditation agree with thine adversary. You've got to get this knowledge beyond the level of the mind or the ocean's going to come up to the shore and erase it right in the sand again. The world mind is the only adversary and when it's recognized as your adversary it becomes your teacher. It's no longer your adversary. It's your adversary until you know it is present. And when you know it is present, it becomes your ally. It places in front of you that which is not. My child is sick. Who said so? The world mind said so. And your little mind, obeying the world mind, says, my child is sick. But your infinite self is saying, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. What child is sick? Did I create a child that could be sick? Look again. Look into the life there. Is it sick or is it divine? Do you know no one's going to do that but a mother or a grandmother? grandfather, a father, someone who loves that child will look deeper and see the life. And suddenly it opens. There it is. Life. Life. Perfect. Perfect life. You're not seeing what human eyes see. You're seeing with a different level of yourself. Something that isn't visible. And that is inner vision. That is soul vision. 
And that soul vision can stand in the face of the whirlwind which says, my baby is sick, and you'll say, well, maybe yours is, but not mine. My baby isn't sick. My baby is the perfect divine image and likeness of God. Now, that little five, six pound form there, that seven, eight pound, ten pound, twelve pound, twenty pound form, thirty, forty, no matter how high up you go, it's always the same. It isn't changing. It isn't changing day by day. It is eternal life. It always will be. It isn't a temporary something. It isn't finite. It isn't that size. That's eternal life. And it is infinite. And I'm looking at infinity with my soul, not finitude with my eyes. What is my adversary going to say about that? I'll tell you what. Your adversary is going to pat you on the back and say, at last I reached you. At last you came above me. You agreed with me quickly on the way. Agree with thine adversary. Come to terms with thine adversary. Understand thine adversary. Don't fight it. Learn how to shake hands with it. Agree. Your adversary is painting the false picture that you may rise above it to see that which is invisible to human eyes. Everywhere you go, that's what's happening. And so, in the world of stealing, again, that's your adversary. Your adversary knows that you will think that is something over there that you want. But you're being trained that that which you're going to seek and want over there, you have over here, and in an even greater quantity. And after a while, you get the idea that the purpose of the lure is to make you stop and say, wait now, wait, Mr. Adversary. Something is tempting me to go there. It must be you working in my mind to tempt me in that direction. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're calling to my attention the fact that right here, that which I want to get there is in greater quantity, and I'm not tempted, and this is soul vision because my eyes don't see that. My eyes cannot see that I have more here than I am tempted to reach out for there in the material world. And finally, I get the idea. The material world is my temptation. I am being tempted to reach into the material world and to draw things to myself. And after I fail in that many, many times, I learn that that which I have sought in the material world is but a counterfeit of what I already have in the creation of God here and now. I have it. And here I'm being tempted to reach out for something that I already have. But I don't know I have it because I'm using the world mind as my mind. Because I only have eye vision instead of soul vision. And so every temptation accepted is the hypnotism of the world mind, and every temptation overcome is the purpose of the temptation, because that is soul vision overcoming temptation. Soul vision saying, I will not kill Christ. What shall I steal when God has given me all that I have? All I can do when I steal is to deny the word of God, the truth of the word of God. So this, the sixth commandment, is teaching you to agree with thine adversary. Don't be caught in that wedge. All is spirit. Who's being killed and who's doing the killing? The world mind. Can you come above that into my kingdom?
Can you leave that false sense of self which lives in a world where people are doing that which is impossible in reality? Can you come above that false sense of self? That is agreeing with thine adversary. Quickly is a double word. It not only means instantly, in fact, it's a triple word. It not only means instantly, it means you must be quickened within in order to do it. And it also means that if you are alert, the presence of that which is unlike God will quicken you by soul vision. The very temptation is the quickening agent if you are alert. And that is how every wrong becomes a right. The instant you see imperfection quickly realize it cannot be there world mind is presenting the illusion to you And whenever you have really done that, you have seen the miracle, haven't you? The illusion is presented, and without even giving it much thought, you right there are aware of the presence of the perfection of God, and without going through the one, two, three, four process, you have agreed with thine adversary quickly. And oftentimes... That's just the first stage of a preparation for something bigger. And when it rumbles in the next day, you say, thank heaven that happened yesterday because this is, it prepared me for this. Always this coming into you in sequential waves. Each temptation is preparing you for a higher level of resistance, of awareness, of non-reaction. The big ones come later, but you have to go through each of the lower ones. And then, in the sermon, it goes on to explain to you why you must agree quickly with the world mind, come to grips with it, understand that it is presenting imperfection, that there is no power of imperfection, it is presenting a complete mirage to you. It is presenting the mirage of form to you. And if you think the form is there but not the condition in the form, you're wrong. The condition is non-existent because the form is non-existent. Something else is there. Spiritual identity is there. Spiritual life is there. And last night we learned that spiritual manifestation is there. And when you deny spiritual life, spiritual manifestation, spiritual identity there, you are killing that which you think you love. I hope this is getting home to you because it's the purpose of our seminar. To awaken us to our own mistakes. To show us how to really love God supremely. And so I will repeat for you, a loving mother can kill her child. An enlightened mother does not. Agree with thine adversary quickly recognized 
that the entire world around you is a creation of the world mind. All of it. If you see the world and accept the world where the kingdom of God is, you are in a state of adultery. If you see humanhood where divinity is, you are in a state of adultery. If you see imperfection where perfection is, once more, adultery. Your fidelity to the truth is the only thing that takes you out of adultery. Humanhood is adultery, automatically. It's divided living. So many just live in matter hoping that someday when they die they'll enter spirit. They live complete lives in adultery while thinking they worship God. Thou shalt not commit adultery is far deeper than the human interpretation. Coveting, of course, is so clear the only thing you really covet is something material. And it isn't there. You can covet it until you pass out of this picture and all you've got is that which you coveted and you're not there. <laughs> Coveting is a completely gross awareness of the material world only. It's the heady green instinct in us polishing apples with a million dollars in the bank. We covet things. We become possessive. Instead of enjoying what we have, we covet it. We seek more to covet. We envy. We become jealous. We hate. We fear. All of these are part of the covetousness of the material mind. It's just a level of material sense. Now, when we rid ourselves of material sense and are in the spiritual realm of awareness, looking at light, we feel the harmonies of that light, the joys of that light. the exquisite beauty that was unseen to the covetous mind. And the reason we now feel these things in a different way is because the world mind is no longer possessing us. We have been released to another way of experience. We have suddenly changed channels. We're in the soul. The soul lives in the kingdom. The world mind confines us to the world. When we live in our soul, we perceive the reality that the eye did not see. We see that God's spirit truly is the invisible substance of all visible form. We see that the law of perfection is the law of all invisible form. We see peace everywhere. We see a peace that is beyond the understanding of the world mind. And a peace that cannot be in any way altered or influenced by the world mind. The world mind cannot enter the real spiritual peace. And again we see the wisdom of spirit. 
just as we could not walk in the kingdom of God in physical form, world mind cannot enter the kingdom of God. And when our consciousness lives in the kingdom of reality, then the form which had been the servant of the world mind becomes the servant of the kingdom of God. and expresses all that is in the divine consciousness. Quickly means before world mind penetrates and sways you, influence, influences you, commands you, and forces you into disloyalty to your own being. We learn in this little verse in the Sermon on the Mount that every trigger that is pulled by a human finger is pulled by the human mind. And that human mind is just a servant of the world mind. When the Father says, Thou shalt not this and thou shalt not that, and you look around at a world in which all of it is going on, and then accept that as reality, you have said, God has no power. God is completely powerless. Here's God, the Almighty, saying, Thou shalt not, and everybody goes around doing it. And we have not stopped and said, well, wait a minute, it's impossible. How can we all go around doing what God told us not to do? Are we more powerful than God? Why hasn't the church told us this? Why hasn't the church said, God said you cannot kill, and how can you be doing it? The church doesn't say that. It says God gave you the option to kill. God gave you the option to steal. God gave you the option to commit adultery and to covet and said, don't do it. And if you want to do it, go ahead and do it. But that isn't it at all. That's not even God, is it? I am omnipresent. I am omnipotent. Would you say to your child, now, don't kill anyone today? How ridiculous. Why do we think God would do less than we would do? I can't conceive of any mother saying, and don't steal today. No. God was showing us that these cannot happen in his creation. But his creation is my creation. And if they happen in my creation and not in his, I'm in the wrong creation. I'm living in the wrong place. And suddenly, when I really believe God is God, I have to see the world as imaginary. It cannot exist. It's doing all the things that the omnipotence of God prevents. What is it? Picture in my mind. A world mind picture which I have been foolish enough to accept because I did not love God. I did not understand God. I understood some religious concept about a God who might punish me if I did these things he told me not to. And there never was such a God. There wasn't even such a me. There is only the pure divine self. Now what is the adversary going to do? Well, if you won't kill and you won't steal or covet or commit adultery, he'll get you another way. So he's going to look around. Now he comes up with a problem, a disease. Oh, I got this terrible disease. It's called this or it's called that. And I fall for it. Sure, I've got that. The doctor says so, he says so, that one says so, and I feel terrible beside. Now I'm worrying just how long I'm going to be here. Six days, five days, four days. 
Why? Because I've got this thing. You see, world mind knew I wouldn't kill. I wouldn't steal. I wouldn't commit adultery. I wouldn't cop it. But it got me at home where it hurts, and now I've got it. And all I've got is world mind. And so when you realize that killing is the prime one that really includes everything else that world mind will throw at you, you're really seeing there that all that is imperfect, all that is unlike God, all that is material, all that is a condition in matter, all that is error, all that is evil, all that is temporary, all that changes, all that is not eternally perfect is a world mind picture. And you've got to go within and set up your conscious awareness of this truth again and again and again because world mind is a very tricky fellow. He could even fool uh, Adam in the Garden of Eden that he was in hell. It'll come at you, as you know, in many, many disguises. But if you know that you are the Spirit of God, that this must be heaven, the living kingdom of God, that you must be the one invisible infinite self now, you're fairly well prepared for Mr. World Mind. And as he comes and hurls to you these accusations about the omnipotent God who is not omnipotent at all, about the omnipresent spirit who is not omnipresent at all, he's only lying to you. And right here, this little creature begins to say to that world mind, I am awakening from the sleep. I can't kill, and neither can you. No one can kill. That which was killed was an image in your mind, Mr. World. It was never there in the first place. All that is still there is the eternal life that never went away, and the invisible manifestation is there. And don't be surprised when you know this, if you don't talk to that invisible manifestation. You can even talk to the invisible manifestation of what is called a living child. And you can do it right now. You can talk to the invisible self of anyone who walks this earth. But not with your human mind. You find, as you are in this great inner freedom, where you're sort of hovering, not in a form, that you feel this communion with the supreme and only intelligence of the universe, in which I am not only one with the Father, but I am one with all that is the one. And in this communion, whatever is needed flows not just a fourth or a fifth dimension, but infinite dimensions. Mr. World, mind cannot enter when you are in the consciousness of truth. In this particular Sermon on the Mount passage, we are told that if we do not become conscious of world mind, 
lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge and the judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast into prison now world mind then brings you to the judge the judge to the officer and thou be cast into prison and this is the degree of acceptance of world mind you make a judgment on it your human mind makes the judgment then you're passed on to the officer who executes the act that you judged you had to do and then because of your act you're in the prison of false belief it's a process a psychological process that occurs finally you're in this belief this one's sick this one's dying this one's hurting this one's lacking this one you have sympathy for that's the sequence first the world adversary made you judge the judge took you into the office now you're sending the flowers of condolences that's the officer and finally here you are and you're stuck in this belief you're in prison that's what it's saying it's not talking about a, a man who's arrested it's talking about an individual who is imprisoned in false world belief about imperfection and it's actually just another way that Jesus took to express what Moses had taken to say thou shalt not kill thou shalt not this thou shalt not that but the Christ in Jesus says it's the world mind that's causing these things they're imaginary and behind all this imaginary imperfection is the imaginary matter of the world. There is no life in an atomic form. You can discover all the atoms of the world. There's no life in them. Because the life in them is strictly the world mind concept of the one unseparated indivisible eternal spiritual you now we want to come to grips with Mr. Adversary this incredible world mind has told us that we have 70.2 years to live and we have believed him he has told us that we must take the good with the bad the health with the bad health we must expect life to have these vicissitudes and we have believed him he has told us that you're going to feel good some days but there are other days when you just got to accept that you can't always feel good. And you can't always expect your competitors to step out of the way and let you flourish. They're going to be fighting for their lives in business. And we believe that. He's told us you better start storing in barns because the day will come when you won't have it. And you think, well, I've got to do that. He tells us you need every kind of insurance to send the child through college. You better get your insurance 20 years earlier. It sounds very simple to us and right. You do need fire insurance. You do need health insurance. You do need life insurance. You need every kind of insurance you can get, says the world mind. And I even have students who are horrified at the thought of not having those insurances my god how could they survive if without that protection and yet we do not believe in omnipotence do we you see how at all points it is revealed to us of our own our own self deceit we don't believe in omnipotence at all it's a nice word. It's comforting. 
Now, the minute I don't believe in omnipotence, I'm committing adultery. And so we're going to continue to commit adultery in many forms, even while we're saying, I am following the Ten Commandments. Some of this hits home when you know it, and you don't know what to do about it. Now, I don't expect you to run out and cancel your fire insurance or your health insurance or your life insurance. But this is part of the divided consciousness that we are forced into by the world mind. We lay up in barns. We store. We have to do it because we have been living in a material consciousness. We are not free of the world mind concept in us, and you cannot do it just by deciding to be free. Don't think that I'm trying to make you determine through willpower that I'll do this and I'll do that. It has to come through the inner release, and that's how you'll recognize your development. Something in you suddenly says, hey, wait a minute. What life am I insuring? Have I taken out insurance on God's life or a personal sense of life? And there it is staring you in the face and you can't deny it. You're in duality. And even then you can't give it up. You've got to remain in duality because you've got to think of those you love. They've got to be protected. And so this is the entanglement, the web This is living by faith without deeds. Now, there must be another way. There must be another way, a way that fulfills the commandments. And that is what your soul has to bring to you. If someone were to tell you what to do, It wouldn't help but just pasting apples on trees. It has to come from within you. Something within you has to show you a better way, a way out of the dilemma of duality, a way in which you do not continue in self-deceit, pretending one thing while you're doing something else. Joel had a way. I don't know if he did it, but he talked about it. He said, don't leave your money to anybody. Don't leave it to anybody, not even your children. He says, heavens no, don't do that. He said, get rid of it. Well, I don't know if he did that. I don't even think he did that. And I don't know if I'm going to do that. But the point is that he was trying to get a message across to us, whether or not he was doing it or we were doing it was something else. Spirit is trying to teach us that we must be free And we must free others. And even though I cannot give you an answer on how to be free, your spirit can, your soul can, and it will lift you into a higher level of intelligence to show you the beautiful way to live in fidelity to the Christ, not partial fidelity, in fidelity to the Christ of everyone, not partial fidelity. There are many ways that the world mind teaches us to commit adultery, to kill, to steal, to covet. Solomon was very wise because when there was no human solution, he found a spiritual solution. And when we are with our backs to the wall in front of the firing squad, we need a spiritual solution. There is no human solution. And it's only in those situations where two objects are colliding and neither will give way that you find the third way, the middle path. 
between good and evil. There's something beside good and there's something beside evil. Between them both. That middle path. As you remember, many of you have said, Joel has said something on page 27 in this book, but on page 34 in a book four years later, he says something that's in direct contradiction. Or even on the same page sometimes. But it was only in contradiction because we were in a material sense. And lo and behold, after bullying our way through that material sense and rising above it, here are these two things that were contradictory which weren't at all. And you will find that same contradiction on a larger scale when you rise above the material sense of life and really shake it off. You'll find solutions that free you. And you'll feel good. You'll feel right about it. Many of us are caught emotionally in all kinds of tangles. We don't have any solutions for it. Something in us wants to go this way, something in us wants to go that way, and yet we know we should go a third way. We don't know how to reconcile it. Our ambition outruns our capacity sometimes. And yet, that's what I mean by two objects that are about to lock horns, neither will give way. You've got to come above human emotion, above human intelligence, and suddenly you're in that airplane looking down, and it's all different. It's all different. Everything is clear. You know what to do. Soul says, I am the way. Turn it over to the Christ. Christ is the way. Christ doesn't kill. Christ doesn't steal. Christ doesn't commit adultery. Christ doesn't covet. Christ doesn't store in barns. Christ has long ago eliminated that which is called the adversary. There might be three little temptations at the beginning of the New Testament and maybe one or two later. But the world mind finds no place in me, says the Christ. Get thee behind me. I live in the universe of spirit, says the Christ. I am not of this world says the Christ. Don't you see me looking at you from the faces of everyone you look at? Can't you see me looking out of their eyes at you? I am the Christ. I am there. I am staring at you. I am looking at you from below and from above and from behind and in front of you. Always. Don't you recognize me? Give me to drink. I am thirsty. And when we make that surrender of the mind, we break the world mind. It only functions in us because we are not Christ-centered. When we become vessels, open vessels, just looking up inside, waiting for the dew of heaven and nothing more. Everything is done the way it must be done. And so I would like you to see that the Sixth Commandment, the Seventh Commandment, the Eighth Commandment, and the Tenth Commandment. represent all of the ways in which we allow the world mind to fool us. When there is none of that in the spiritual kingdom of God on earth. Agree with thine adversary. Get into that plane and fly up above the world mind until it is dissipated, 
above the conditions it presents. Now we're not looking at each other and accepting what we see. We're not walking in a world mind form. This we refuse to do. If I walk in a world mind form, I'm saying to the world mind, kill me, kill me. You will eventually, so do it now. If I walk in a world mind form, I'm saying to my neighbor, rob me, rob me. If I walk in a world mind form, the omnipotence of God is of no value to me whatsoever. So the prodigal starts homeward, away from the world mind. That mind in us, which we had trusted, is the servant of the world mind. That mind in us is the mind that sees what God did not create, because the world mind functions this individual mind. They are one and the same. Just as God individualizes as your spiritual self, the world mind individualizes as your creature sense of self. Ignore it, and you are violating the only truths that can place you where you belong. I was able during the latter part of last evening to come to some conclusions about these tapes. I think it would be wise for us not to have any monthly tapes for the rest of the year. I have noticed quite a number of you have asked for these tapes, so I don't think you should get these tapes and also a monthly tape. There's no point of confusion or duplicating I think the message is coming through these tapes very well, and they will serve as the monthly tapes. There's no sense of having both. And so those of you who have ordered these tapes, you can either take them all at once as, or you can take them at a two a month. And uh, uh, the orders that we have for them, we'll deliver them all at once, except for those of you who specify, se send me two a month. And if you have already given in your order to Eunice or me, and you feel you want them two a month, just tell her or me. And if we don't hear from you on that, we'll just send them all at once. But I do feel that if you get your tape the latter part of this month, the first two tapes, you should use the months that follows to study those two tapes. Now, if you're a quick student, fine, you can have them all now. It's up to you. But then... By the end of four or five months, you will have done ten, ten tapes, you see. And I feel that if you get these ten commandments, and what else may be discussed, under your belt by Christmas, I think there'll be a different you walking this earth. And I'd rather see that than have you just be getting tapes and tapes and tapes when this is the essence of what you must do ultimately. So that's it. Let us know if you want them in twos instead of all at once, and if we don't hear from you, we'll presume you want them all at once. But those who have ordered them, please tell us how you want them. And those of you who are on the monthly tape list, I regret that there will be no more monthly tape lists, and I just reached that conclusion within the last 10, 15 hours. I just feel that you 
have something more important right at this point. I would say, though, that the monthly tapes will begin again right after Christmas. So that in January, automatically, you'll get your monthly tape if you're on that list. All right. Now, let's see. We have taken care of the dinner for tomorrow night, presumably, the airport bus, and the tapes. We have two classes to go. We're going to do the Ninth Commandment tonight. Do not bear false witness. And then, I presume, it will lead to whatever our tenth class is going to be. If you want to be giving some thought to the Ninth Commandment, you might find that will prepare you for that which is called bearing true witness. That will complete the commandments and leave us tomorrow as a soul day because having completed the Ten Commandments should lead us to soul awareness. And so this is the sequence that we'll be following. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.